Well, hello everybody. Uh, this is Cody Mack with Kalefi North America. I'm grateful for you guys to be here today. Happy Thursday. Uh, today we're going to be joined by uh, Mr. Mark Etherton uh, to talk about commercial boiler changeouts and, and some of the things that he's learned in his many years in the industry. Uh, we're also joined by uh, uh, Mr. Bob Hot Rod Roar. Uh, so just uh, take pleasure in that today that you're you're going to be chatting today with two of the Carlson Holohan Award winners uh, from previous years and the most recent one as well. And uh, and before we get into the meat and potatoes here, let's go through some of the uh, uh, housekeeping slides. So if you do have any issues with the audio, um, you know, a lot of times you can just restart it and go from there. Uh, just remember that we uh, we try to help out as much as we can. But if you do have any questions, you can always call the technical support line within GoToWebinar. And if you do want to receive a copy of today's presentation, at the end of the webinar, there's going to be a little survey. Uh, you can click yes in there and you'll get sent a copy of it. And then if you do want to listen at another date, we do record all of these webinars and they're put up on our YouTube channel. Uh, it should be within a day or two, usually uh, after the webinar is done live. So. And if you do attend the full webinar today, we do send out a certificate of attendance to your email that you registered with. So uh, make sure to look for that guy as well. Uh, that should be coming here shortly after, again, after the webinar is done. And then from there, you know, just some upcoming stuff that we've got going on here. We started a, a little later evening uh, uh, webinar, basically a broadcast there with Hot Rod. Uh, in conjunction with Mechanical Hub. It's called Shop Talk with Bob Hot Rod Roar. And, and this week he's gonna be talking about primary, secondary, and uh, and just kind of helping you out with some of that stuff. Really cool, he's doing it right from his shop there. You can kind of see a nice little uh, trainer demo in the background. So uh, you'll you'll get to see some of the insights into, into Bob's world there. And then uh, another Roar uh, added into the mix here. Uh, we're gonna be talking with Max Roar on next month's Coffee with Kalefi, uh, talking about radiant cooling applications as well. Uh, Max is, uh, is a great resource from, uh, from Ray Howe, and uh, he's gonna be talking about some of that stuff there as well. And uh, before we get started, I do wanna mention too that if you do have any questions, uh, make sure to put it into the questions pane uh, within the webinar. We'll try to get to them uh, if we can. If we can't, we'll, uh, we'll make sure to get to them after the webinar uh, comes up. But without further ado, uh, let's welcome Mark Etherton. Uh, welcome to uh, welcome to Coffee with Kalefi again. Your second time now, right? Yeah, Cody. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and thank you to the folks at Kalefi, as well as he mentioned the most recent recipient of the Carlson Hallahan Industry Award of Excellence, Bob Roar. Good yeah, to talk to you, Bob. Thanks. And greetings to everybody across the United States. I'm sure that everybody is uh, buckling down and in their anti-COVID chambers as I am. I've got black lights in every corner. I'm having to wear two pairs of dark glasses to avoid burning my eyes. But hey, there ain't no germs going to survive this puppy down here. Uh, who'd ever thought we'd find ourselves in this situation? And it's kind of a new way of life, but uh, we need to get used to it and do the right thing moving forward so that we can get this economy back together and keep things going strong. So again, thank you everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend this seminar. I hope that when you leave, you will have a much better understanding and a higher degree of comfort in moving into some of these large commercial projects, which are all in dire need of boiler replacements. So on today's topics, the first thing that we're going to do is to run the numbers, show you the math, figure out exactly what it is that's gonna be necessary as far as sizing the replacement boilers are concerned, uh, the due diligence in the field to make sure that what you're putting in is going to work correctly and also to find out whether or not the system that's there has been working correctly in the first place. There's no sense inheriting somebody else's problems. Uh, we also need to make sure that we can accommodate the system's needs during retrofit. Most of these multifamily dwellings continue to be occupied as we're going in there and replacing these systems. And it's important that you maintain services throughout, otherwise your phone and the phone at the HUD office will start ringing and it won't quit ringing until you make these people happy. Uh, the replacement design process and then uh, plan your work and work your plan. And I can thank my uh, former mentee, current mentor, coach Jim French for that little ditty there. Next slide, please. All right, so this is the building, our subject building that we'll be talking about. Uh, obviously, it's a very good sized building. This building was built, I believe, in 1972. It originally had some uh, large Ajax 
uh, water tube boilers installed in it, basically 80% thermally efficient. Uh, seasonal efficiency is off of the charts terrible. And uh, unfortunately, the people that were operating this building had no idea what they were dealing with. And they didn't want to have their phone ring, so they kept everything turned to its highest, hottest temperature all the time, which as a hydronics retrofit contractor makes me smile. Uh, the first thing I look for when I come onto a property like this during the heating season is to see how many open windows are in the building. And it's kind of hard to tell from this perspective, but roughly half of the windows were open in this building on a marginal call for heat, which tells me one of two things. Either the system is overdrive, or the people are wasting energy by keeping their thermostats turned up. And this building originally was controlled by pneumatic controls throughout. There was a large compressor in the mechanical room with distribution mains and branches that went out to all the individual pneumatic thermostats and pneumatic control devices. Uh, the owners of the building could not find anybody that could competently fix that, so they retrofitted the whole building with non-electric thermostatic radiator valves, which is actually to our advantage. We'll talk about that as we go through the seminar. Next slide, please. There's a tool available on the internet, which is fantastic from the standpoint of being able to get a real good overview of these buildings. And it's basically Google Earth, and you can get Google Earth Pro for free. And it gives you the ability to be able to perform certain measurements. You cannot measure anything vertically from the street view. So you'll need to know roughly how many foot each story is. And generally speaking, 10 foot will usually cover you. And then you can figure out how many stories of building that you've got and how much exposure you've got. If you look at the roof on the lower left hand side, you can see a large, tall black shadow just above that red parapet. That is the vent stack for the boiler. The boilers are directly below that, 13 stories down. So there is a significant amount of vertical stack action that was occurring on this particular system. And next slide, please. A part of the process is the need to be able to figure out how many square feet of building you're dealing with. Uh, very rarely does anybody have any blueprints available from you. So the onus comes on you for being able to actually calculate this stuff and see what's going on. And this is one of the tools that Google Earth allows you to do is to measure the footprint of the building. They've got a measure feature, which you can do with either a line path, polygon circle, 3D path, whatever you want to do. And essentially you have to write down the dimensions that you're recording but basically I was able to determine that this building was 216 feet wide. And then I was also to able to figure out what the depth on it was, which allows me to go in and do some basic math calculations to figure out how many square foot of building I'm actually serving with the physical plan on the system. Next slide, please. So these are the fire breathing dragons that were down in this mechanical room. And you can see to the left of that left-hand boiler, there's a burner laying there. There was actually a burner that had fallen off of its orifice, its setting within the actual combustion chamber itself. And so they were just basically dumping raw gas into this thing and had been doing that for quite some time. Uh, basically, you can see that this is a one-third, two-thirds type of boiler application. Essentially what happens is the burner in the middle, that one-third portion, is what the pilot safeties are connected to. So on a call for heat, it will fire that boiler and or that burner. And once that burner is confirmed as being lit, then it, if necessary, then it'll go ahead and bring on the other two thirds of the stage. And essentially as it starts approaching its set point temperature, then it falls back to the one third burner again, which theoretically you'd think would make a pretty good efficient operation. However, what does not change is the amount of air that's being drawn through the combustion chamber for primary and secondary air. And that basically dilutes the heat that's going up through the actual heat exchange surfaces themselves to the point where the numbers are terrible. I've seen the combustion efficiency of these appliances down to as low as 57%. And that's basically where that boiler spends the majority of its time, sitting on its haunches, running on one third burner. So the thermal seasonal efficiency of this type of an appliance is terrible. Uh, there were two boilers here. Originally, the system was also doing domestic hot water through a sidearm heat exchanger type of assembly. And they eventually abandoned that in favor of putting some standalone high efficiency condensing gas water heaters in. 
and uh, basically the capacity of these boilers were designed for that large domestic hot water load. I can tell you from experience that ASHRAE develops design profiles for or demand profiles for domestic hot water for housing operations that are multifamily, for dormitories, for hotels, for motels, etc. But they do not have one for a HUD property. This is a low income housing property. The majority of the people that live here are senior citizens. And having personally attempted to monitor these systems to see if there was any kind of a demand profile, the only thing that I found in common was that when there was going to be a bingo game that night, everybody hit the showers. Other than that, there is no consistency to the demand profile whatsoever. Next slide, please. Bingo night's real important, Mark. So I it is. <laughs> I'm well, sure you're that the gambling casino bus. If there's a casino bus out in the parking lot, you're guaranteed everybody's going to shower. <laughs> So this is the view of the other side of this equipment. And something that's important to note as you go through these properties on a walkthrough is to look at everything. Uh, it's hard to tell by looking at it, but there's actually a lot of asbestos containing material on this boiler. It was installed in the 70s. The use of asbestos was very prevalent. It was very common. And the first thing that you have to do is to bring your subcontractors in that are going to be necessary and responsible for baiting the ACMs off of these systems. Well, guess what? These older boilers also had ACMs in a combustion chamber. So as they come in and they abate all of the outside exterior piping of the near boiler piping itself, that's great. And then we have another contractor that is a subcontractor of ours called Boiler Buster that comes in and takes the boiler apart, literally cuts it apart into pieces. But when you get it down to the combustion chamber, then they've got to back back out of the room again and allow the asbestos containment contractors to come back in and redo all of the asbestos on the inside of the combustion chamber. And then Boiler Busters has to come back in and finish their job. And eventually, once they're completely done, they'll get rid of everything, take it out, give us a clean space to be able to come back in and start reconstructing the boilers. In this particular case, we had two boilers. And next slide, please. Cody, next slide. Yep. This one? Yep. There we go. So Sorry we had that. two 4 million BTU an hour boilers that were sitting there. So that gives us 8 million BTUs per hour input at sea level. Uh, anybody that's here in the Denver area or any altitude area knows that you've got to go through with these atmospheric appliances. You need to derate them by 4% per 1,000 foot above sea level. So next slide. The duration is basically 8 million BTUs times 0.64 would give us a net out of 5.12 million BTUs. And the 0.64 basically comes from 80% efficient and a 20% duration. So 0.8 times 0.8 gives you a combined duration factor of 0.64. So the net out of this boiler is 5,120,000 BTUs per hour. We figured out what the dimensions of the building were and then divided the square footage by the BTUs available and basically came up with 29 BTUs per square foot per hour. And I know that the industry standard is 30 and it has been that way forever. I don't know who came up with that number, but oddly enough, it seems to work out quite well. The next step to this whole process is to do what we call an EDR study, which is basically the equivalent develop radiation. We go into each individual unit, we take sample buildings, we don't do every individual apartment, but we'll take the worst case scenarios and the best case scenarios. So the second floor has got the only loss that it would have as far as heat loss is concerned would be the exterior of the portions of the building itself. But if you get to the top floor outside corners and you've got wall and ceiling loss, and we look at the amount of baseboard that is located in there and basically calculate all of that back into a BTU factor. All right, so we've got 4,836 linear feet of baseboard radiation at roughly 500 BTUs per output per hour. Gives us a net output capacity of 2,418,000 BTUs. So if we take that demand and divide it by the net output capacity of the boilers after deration and combustion efficiency, we find out that basically the boilers are twice as large as they need to be. They could operate on one boiler, even at design condition, and have more than adequate heat. Well, I'll give you a small little note of interest here. And in having been doing this for 43 years this summer, 
one thing that I have found is that even with this information, when you show up at design condition and you see the boiler doing a 50% duty cycle, it tells us that we've oversized that physical plant by roughly 50%. And there isn't a contractor in his right mind that's gonna look at this and go, you know what? I'm gonna cut that load in half and put in a boiler and see what happens. We've all got to do due diligence. We're going to put in what the numbers tell us to put in, unless we want to find ourselves in a court of law trying to explain to the judge why it is that we didn't follow a standard of practice. So back to this, the EDR capacity of 2,418,000 BTUs divided by four tells us that we need four boilers with an output of roughly 605,000 BTUs per hour. Why would I want to divide my load by four? Well, bear in mind, we're dealing with modulating boilers here, modulating condensing boilers, and as much turned down as we can get on these things, that's the ideal condition. Theoretically, when you get down below about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, that boiler should turn on and it should not turn off. It should modulate to the load. Well, if it's a big boiler, it's gonna short cycle. But if you've got four small boilers, you've got a lot better chance of being able to sustain the burn on these things without going into a short cycle condition that's gonna kill your efficiency. So how do we divide this load and get it up to the point where we are taking into consideration its thermal efficiency and its altitudinal duration? Well, this is another one of those little math games. Basically, we take the 604,500 and divide by 0.81. And the way that we got to that 0.81 is that we're looking at a approximate thermal efficiency of 90%. I hear people in the background say, no, 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 it's 95 cover yourself. Five points is not going to kill anybody. Use 0.9. All right. So the duration factor for a high efficiency sealed combustion appliance is not the same 4% that it is for the atmospheric. It's roughly half of that. All right. So the difference between the thermal efficiency at 90% and the altitudinal rate duration at 0.9 gives us a combined factor of 0.81. So basically we need four boilers with an input of 672,000 BTUs per hour, and that's at 5,000 foot above sea level. Your altitude varies, you need to adjust accordingly. All right, so domestic hot water load can and often does exceed the spacing demand. Remember, these originally, these boilers were doing domestic hot water, and they basically had to be sized to handle that peak demand. Well, the interesting thing about peak demands is that peak demands last for about one hour. If it's a multifamily, uh, conventional apartment complex type situation, the peak load is between six and seven o'clock in the morning, assuming that people are gonna to go to work at eight. And basically you find yourself in a situation where you're driving tax with sledgehammers for the balance of the time, which is not good. That's the reason that the seasonal efficiency of these atmospheric boilers are so terrible. That combined with the fact that it's gonna be running on one third of its burner combustion chamber capacity and have a whole lot of dilution air that's going through there, and in this particular case, it was also compounded by the fact that they had barometric dampers that were on the draft control system of the boilers themselves. They had about five pounds of washers that had been applied to it. Uh, it was not relieving the excess draft at all. I asked the chief engineer about it. And he said, oh, we didn't want any carbon monoxide leaking out of our boiler. I understand. Trust me, at that point where that barometric damper is, there isn't going to be anything coming out of there. Everything's going to be going in. So it was too late. They'd already had it that way for many years, which is to my advantage because we're gonna be able to knock the living whatever out of their fuel bills by putting these high efficiency modulating condensing boilers in, All right? So we have to size the boiler to the largest load. And in this particular case, the domestic hot water was the greater of the two loads. And you have to recognize the potential for picking up additional work. When we first came onto this site, they had the two boilers and they had three standalone gas fired high efficiency water heaters that were completely independent of the system. But I looked at those and I said, they've got a finite life expectancy. We need to take that into consideration for the future going forward so that when they do fail, that we can take that opportunity and seize it and latch onto it. So we configured the system layout and designed such that it would accommodate future expansion, which in this case, basically added four ball valves, I'm sorry, total of eight ball valves and a little bit of pipe valve and fitting and some caps so that if we ever got into a situation where we wanted to do the domestic hot water, that we didn't have to drain the building down. We had full isolation available. 
All we had to do was add additional pumps to it and storage tanks with heat exchangers and set it up such that the boilers could then provide domestic hot water as well as space heating. Next slide, please. So essentially, can one boiler be eliminated during the heating season? In this particular case, the answer was yes. And that was a fortunate thing because we took this job on while it was still in the middle of heating season. And you've got to make sure that you keep your clients happy. If you don't, I guarantee you that the job is not going to go well at all. Next slide. So in this particular case, the dark outlines are basically the boiler pads where the existing 4 million BTU an hour boilers were the fire breathing dragons. And uh, essentially what we did is we chopped and dropped the right hand boiler first. And once it was out of our way, then we went ahead and set our new high efficiency modulating condensing boilers onto the same pad. The dark lines that come from the right with the round circles were the return lines coming back from the heating system and essentially went into the bottom of the old boiler and came out of the top of the old boilers. And essentially we put in our own valves, isolated it and set it up such that we could tie our boilers our new boilers into a primary secondary. Now this was my original conceptual drawing. Once I got my actual boiler mechanic out into the field, he said, you know, I think this would work better if I flip flop these boilers to a different direction. It'll be easier to be able to service that, which is important. Remember, you can put five pounds of sugar into a two pound bag, but you're gonna have to work on it and you don't wanna tear the seams. So if you can set these systems up such that they are conducive to future service, you're gonna save yourself a whole lot of time and trouble in the, in the future. Next slide. So these are the old fire breathing dragons that one that is closest to you with the red fire eye box on it was the first one that we chopped and dropped. And uh, you really can't see it, but on the upper right hand side of that is the barometric damper that had about five pounds worth of weight that was connected to the chain that was basically keeping it closed. So you've got 13 stories worth of stack plus 10 foot of additional stack on top of the roof itself. You've got boilers that were being kept in a ready, steady, hot state, 24 hours a day, uh, not quite 365 days a year. They did have the knowledge and, and ability to be able to go down and turn the boilers off whenever it was warm outside. There were no automatic controls to be able to shut it down. But in any case, that combination essentially makes this boiler an extreme gas hog. Uh, we had fuel line, which is the black iron pipe to the right with the yellow tape around it on the right-hand side of the photo there. So that was readily available for the technicians and the installers so that they could retrofit the new installation and set it up. We had an isolation cock there with that big black pipe on the right hand side and then we had large gate valves on the left hand side. So in this particular case, it was very conducive to replacing the boilers, the heating system, because the boilers were not doing domestic hot water. DHW was being provided by the separate standalone systems, which had problems. We'll talk about that as we get into it. And uh, basically, this is where we started under the project itself. After we updated it, they came in and chopped it and dropped it. And then we moved in with our new equipment. Next slide, please. So this is another view from the left-hand side itself. I don't know why they called this boiler number two, because in my opinion, you go from left to right. And I would have called this one number one and the other one number two, but that's irrelevant. Uh, you can see that the fire doors on these things were extremely warped. The refractory was shot. Uh, fortunately, when my mechanic went in to disable this system to get it ready for boiler busters, he had the foresight to basically scavenge all of the controls that he possibly could, that red fire eye that you saw in that last photograph, and kept those. And it's a good thing because we no sooner got the first boiler chopped and dropped and the second boiler decided to lock out on a weekend, due to a bad ignition module. And essentially they had a spare one on site that they were able to actually swap out and get the boiler back up and running again. So anticipate failure. It's, it's really not your problem, but it does become your problem because you're working on the system. Next slide. So in order to accommodate the <clears throat> system needs during a retrofit consideration, you have to determine whether one boiler will work can be eliminated during the heating season. And if the answer is yes, then you can do this retrofit during the heating season itself. And is the production to domestic hot water dependent upon the hydronic system as a heat source? And if it is, then you may have to make some accommodations in your bid 
to transfer the piping from the remaining boiler over to the domestic hot water if it's not already set up parallel. And essentially, we have found ourselves in situations where we have had to go in and chop and drop a boiler that was doing domestic hot water. We will set a temporary domestic hot water heating system. Well, we're guaranteed that those two little 199s, 80 gallon tanks that we're sticking in there are not going to be capable of handling the load. So we have to put letters out to the residents explaining to them that we're working on the system, that we're trying to resolve some problems and that we're going to do our best to keep them in hot water. And what are the demand profiles? For this particular installation, with it being low, low income housing, uh, there are still some people that work. So there are some people that are getting up and showering early in the morning, but the majority of them do not have jobs. They're retired senior citizens or this disabled citizens. And basically they spread their time out over a significantly wider time frame, which gives us a lot of flexibility. If this were a regular apartment complex, you don't have any flexibility. Everybody's got to get up and shower to go to work and basically you're going to be very limited on what you can do with them and it takes a lot of explaining and a lot of cooperation on their part in order for the program to work so yes can the demand be spread out over a longer time frame next slide so here's a letter that we developed for these folks at the Juanita in Alaska that's the name of this apartment complex and basically explained to them that we were working on a system and ask them that if they were in a situation where they had to go to work, that they could share between 5 and 8 a.m. And if they didn't have to go to work, they could share any time after 8 a.m. And the reason that we had to do this was that as we were walking around through the building doing our initial survey, we always ask the residents questions. If you ask management, they will tell you there are no problems in their building whatsoever. But if you ask the residents, they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, we're always running out of hot water. But it usually comes back within 10 or 15 minutes. and Sometimes it's not available after X amount of clock in the morning or in the afternoon and you make notes on this stuff and you find out that there are in fact problems within the system. And if you ask the maintenance folks, they may tell you, it kind of depends. Sometimes they'll say, uh, yeah, no problem whatsoever. And then sometimes when you talk to them, they'll say, yeah, we got all kinds of problems. And you have to prompt them. You have to ask them questions like, uh, hey, do you uh, spring any pinhole leaks in your circulation return systems? Oh, yeah, do we ever? Oh, hey, that's a problem we have a cure for. But basically, in viewing these maintenance people and asking about these questions, write this information down because you're going to own this. When you're done and you put in this new system, if there's a bunch of existing problems that you did not address, they become your problem. So if you address them up front, then you take a lot less chance of having to bite off more than you can chew and go back to the property owners and the property management company and say, I'm sorry, we're going to need more money. We ran into more problems than we anticipated. Due diligence, ask questions, look around, look at the piping system, see if there have been any issues, talk to the residents, are you comfortable? Is it hot? Is it cold? Are the windows open? Are the windows closed? These are all things that are a part of the program in making sure that you can address them. Next slide. So these were the three standalone gas fired hot water heaters. You can see the piping in the background there. They were piped parallel reverse return, which really caught me by surprise. It's not usually the way it goes. Usually they pipe them parallel direct return or they will pipe them in such a manner that it's pyramidic and there's really no balance to it whatsoever. But uh, in one of the photos that are coming up, you'll notice that the middle water heater hasn't got any control lights on it. And when we first got there, it was locked out and we reset it and it appeared to start. We walked away from it, let it go. And I made note of that in my survey that domestic hot water appeared to have problems. Plus I could see where they rebuilt the circulation return in the mechanical room because of hydraulic erosion and just a lot of different problems that they had with that. They didn't hire us to look at this, but as a part of our due diligence, we looked at it and we questioned it. And sure enough, we found out that their middle water heater had actually failed in the heat exchanger and the whole combustion chamber was completely submerged. It was full of water and they had not closed the isolation valve to it. So it was basically providing dilution to the other two water heaters that were working, but unfortunately it was in the middle. So as you get hot, mixed with cold, mixed with hot, then you get a lot of lukewarm water. And the residents basically got used to it. It's like, hey, you know, we just rally around the fact that we even got warm water. But these water heaters we basically eliminated, as you can see on the far left-hand side of that photograph, there is a new tank there. That new tank is a reverse indirect. 
And if you're going to be dealing with these apartment complexes, that's my recommendation because a reverse indirect is like 99% efficient in heat transfer. And a little secret that they don't tell you is that essentially you need a boiler supply water temperature that's roughly 10 degrees hotter than your desired discharge temperature from the domestic hot water storage tank itself. So if you want 130 degree Fahrenheit discharge temperatures, you need to heat that tank up with 140 degree Fahrenheit water from your heat source. Well, what good is that going to do you? Well, it's a condensing boiler, and it loves to see return water temperatures less than 140. If you're supplying the tank with 140, you're guaranteed that your return water temperature coming back to the boilers are going to be significantly lower than 140, which means that the boilers are even condensing when they're doing domestic hot water. If you use a conventional indirect, the manufacturer wants you to hit that with 180 degree Fahrenheit water. And if you do, you're not going to be returning back low enough to be able to cause the appliance to condense. So it basically goes back to an 85% efficient boiler at that point. So bear this in mind. There's, there's uh, a couple of different manufacturers of the reverse indirects that are out there. I would strongly recommend that you look into them and get comfortable with them. Next slide. All right, so we have to ask management to provide us with copies of the thermal energy utility bills. And this is basically going to give you the ability to be able to get real time data as it pertains to the occupants for a reverse analysis to see if you're close to being correct in boiler sizing itself. Ideally, if you can show up to the property well in advance of doing any work at all and put some data loggers onto it that would record the runtime of the gas valve, you need to verify the input of the appliance by clocking the gas meter. You need to verify the output of the appliance by doing a combustion analysis. You need to watch the ambient conditions outside in real time. Then basically you can get yourself a snapshot that says, okay, this building used this many therms per degree day. And basically take that, divide it by the square footage of the building and see if what you're dealing with as far as boiler sizing is concerned is anywhere near correct. And again, and having done this over the years, what I typically find is that even if I calculate the load through a conductive heat loss and infiltration loss for the building and come up with 30 BTUs per square foot per hour and find out that I've got enough fin tube radiation within the space itself to be able to handle that demand, when I show up there at design condition and I see a condensing boiler doing 50% or I see a mo or an on-off boiler doing a duty cycle that is equivalent to basically being on 50% of the time, it tells me that these boilers are twice as large as they need to be. And that's because none of our heat loss calculations take into consideration internal gains. Every body is good for 500 BTUs. Every watt is good for three BTUs. Every electricity watt that's used inside of that building goes to the contribution to the space heating load itself. And more importantly is the thermal flywheel effect. This building is concrete all the way throughout. So it's a huge thermal flywheel that once it's charged and it's sustaining, that if you do get into a situation of design condition, which is less than 2% of the time, you can dip down into that and really not run out of heat. I mean, the mass starts contributing to the actual load itself and uh, essentially avoids the need to be able to power up the physical plant. But again, nobody in their right mind is gonna take that into consideration. The advantage of the modulating boiler is that it's gonna right size itself to whatever the real time load is. And by having four boilers in here instead of one, then I've got an even greater turndown ratio. If I've got a five to one turndown, if I've got four of these in here, then I've got an exact, a significantly higher turndown ratio, which basically means that there will always be a time when there's only one boiler on satisfying the load. And with the particular boilers that we installed in this job, they're all interfaced to our bus, plus we have an internet connection to them that they can do rotation, they can do alternation, they do everything they need to do automatically. And again, I have yet to see this thing at more than 50% of load of capacity, even at design condition. Next slide. We actually, uh, Mark, while well, we've got you here, uh, we actually got a good mm -hmm. question in from, uh, from Bo. Uh, I do believe Bo is from your neck of the woods as well out in Colorado. Um, but he mentions, don't you also need to check the actual system distribution efficiency as well as clocking the meter and doing combustion analysis and so on and so forth? He says, wouldn't you want to know what you're actually getting the delivery, you know, what you're actually getting for delivery for the fuel that you're burning? 
It is. That's the reason that we have to do the combustion analysis to make sure that the appliance is putting out what we think it is. But the problem with that is that when we test this appliance, there's two conditions that we're going to test it under. One is cold start, which means that it's running 100% of its capacity, and that's where we'll see a thermal efficiency of 80%, but it spends the majority of its time operating with just that one-third burner, and at that point, we're down around 55%. And so do you average 55 to 80% to see what your seasonal efficiency in this thing is? I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to calculate. Uh, it's, it's important to do that due diligence because if you've got a boiler that is extremely sick, that's corroded, that's got you know, calcium buildup on the water side, has never been descaled, then you're gonna see terrible efficiency numbers. And if you don't know that those numbers are there, then it's going to affect your net efficiency. And quite honestly, we can justify what it is that we're doing and saying, okay, the installed cost is this, the fuel savings are this, the return on the investment is going to occur at this point in time, but the owners don't care. They're not looking at it from that standpoint. They just basically want a physical plant that is very, very reliable so that their residents don't start calling them and complaining about a lack of heat. And it all comes down to system design. So a part of this is the process of going into the apartments and looking at what is there. In this particular case, they use the Long Island heating loss calculation method. I'm sure you're familiar with that. If there's a linear foot of external wall, it's got to be covered by baseboard. So we had more than enough baseboard throughout this whole system. We also found that we had non-electric thermostatic radiator valves. Well, each apartment basically was one zone. But whoever installed these decided to put one of the TRVs into the bedroom and another TRV into the living space. Well, it was one continuous circuit through there. So if the bedroom was turned down because they like a cooler sleeping environment, the living room also cooled down. And they didn't understand that. So we had to basically re-educate all the residents as a part of our job about how these TRVs work, how to set them. We had to give them a scale. They come with a zero to five setting on it. And we had to re-educate them to leave it at three and a half. Don't move it, set it and forget it. And we had to do that in numerous languages. And when we did that, all of a sudden the complaint factors went to zero, which made management very happy. Very cool. I didn't know you were a multilingual as well, Mark. Add that to your, your list of accomplishments. See, <laughs> see, we, we, we. <laughs> that too. So we have to determine route, manner, and method of the replacement while maintaining service. And that's basically a matter of thinking ahead, looking at it, designing it such that you can install this system and bring the new boiler online before you take the other boiler offline. And this particular system was very conducive to it. Normally, we like to use as many Kalefi products as we possibly can. We'll set these things up primary, secondary, with a triple separator, low loss header, air eliminator, dirt eliminator. But in this particular case, the piping was not conducive to that. So we ended up having to set it up so that each boiler was set up as a primary secondary. We left the space heating loop as our primary and then pumped the boilers into that loop as secondaries. So you have to develop the basic floor plan to make sure that you can fit five pounds of sugar into the two pound bag and not tear the seams. That's important because you have to look at it from the standpoint of, I am going to be responsible for servicing this thing and I don't want to get into any trouble. You see that rectangle down there on the bottom, but to the right of that valve? Yeah, that. that's a column. That's a concrete column that basically supports the building. So if I were to have B4 over in that area, it would include access to the combustion chamber if I installed it wrong. So you've got to look at things like this and set it up so that it is going to be conducive to service. Otherwise, if it doesn't get serviced, the efficiency of this system is going to suffer. And we've had some properties where the operators of the building refused to do any service or maintenance on their systems. And we go back in there five years later and the boilers are trashed. I mean, they, they, nobody knew what they were doing with the operation of them. After the warranty, they took it out of our hand. They had the controls turned to 180 degrees because that's where it's supposed to be. And basically fried the heat exchangers and fried the wiring and fried everything on that boiler. And it was, it was sad. I mean, they're gonna have to have new boilers on that particular installation, but you have to make sure that you set these systems up so that it's conducive to servicing, because if you don't, it'll never get serviced. Next slide. Perfect. And we actually had one one other question. I think you already answered it here. Uh, our good friend up in Quebec asked if reducing the boiler capacity, does it have effect on the supply and return water velocities? But since you're hydraulically separating, that should be pretty much a, a, a mute point. 
It is, and as we get further through this slide, we'll see what we did to the actual circulation pumps themselves. It's a part of the system. And the pumps that were installed in this particular project were set up for that worst case scenario, that 2% of the time, that design condition. And so for 98% of the time, they're grossly oversized. In this particular case, there was a pressure activated bypass around the pumps because the pumps were not being modulated. We eliminated that, put VFDs under the pumps and basically set it up so that it's a fully modulating system. The boilers modulate, the pump modulates based on the amount of valves that are open, trying to maintain a given pressure differential. And then essentially the TRVs are adding to that because they're also a modulating control. They're not a bang bang control. So the whole system basically modulates to the load, which as you're standing in there listening to this whole system operating, it's like a symphony. I mean, it's so cool to hear the boilers modulating, the pump modulating, and nobody's complaining. Everybody's happy. So we have to check regulation compliance and system compatibility. Uh, pretty much everybody in the United States is subject to the ASAB codes. And depending on your jurisdiction, and I recommend that you talk to your jurisdiction. These people are there for your education. We have the uh, Colorado boiler inspectors that come by our classroom about once a year, tell us what's new, what to watch for, what they're looking for, uh, what, what makes the hair stand up on the back of their neck, and what it is that we do that makes them smile. And uh, we found out that ASME, does everybody know the meaning of ASME? I think Bob does. Bob? Always, sometimes, maybe, except. <laughs> I didn't know that version of it. <laughs> oh, you didn't? <laughs> no, no. Well, if you're a contractor, it stands for a substantial monetary exchange. I think anybody is going to argue with me on that. Now, nope. Technically, it's the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and they dictate the pressure withstanding capacity, the relief valve capacity. There's a whole bunch of stuff that they specify. There's a whole series of codes, vessel codes, boiler codes, etc. And essentially, what we found out was that on some of our low-rise buildings, if we can put a 30-pound relief valve on the boiler and on the storage tanks, we don't have to use ASME-compliant equipment. That's a huge savings. But it varies by jurisdiction. So talk to your inspectors and see if they view it the same way. Next slide. So this is our project again. And after we got done doing our retrofit, I like to take a drive by again and see how many windows are open. And none of them were open. They're all closed. You start limiting the operation of the system and people realize that that it's not going to be vomiting heat all over their bodies as they're standing there, then they have no solution or no option but to have to close the windows. And it's it's a, a great thing to be able to show to the consumer a before and after. This is your building before, this was your building after, and oh, by the way, we're going to reduce your fuel consumption by a minimum of 30%. And with as much stack action as you had going on in this building with the five pounds of barometric weights that you had on each one of the, the boilers relief dampers, you're probably gonna see more in the area of around 50%. I've not had an opportunity to go back and review the fuel bills on this thing, but I'm confident that we're someplace between 30 and 50% reductions in fuel consumption, which is huge. Next slide. You know the old saying, Mark, no news is good news. If, if they had something to complain yeah, about, you'd know about it. <laughs> that is true. So as you're doing your walkthrough on these mechanical systems, you want to bring your asbestos abatement contractor, you want to bring in your electrical contractors, you've got to bring in pretty much anybody that's going to have anything to do with you as a subcontractor and make sure they all see the same thing. You want to make sure that everybody shares whatever photographs that they have and field observation notes. Somebody else may have seen something that you didn't see. Uh, I've got mercury listed in there. In this particular case, mercury was not an issue, but there are a lot of older heating systems out there and older apartment complexes that we run into these on the all the time that are basically the Honeywell number one heat generator. And it has about a pint of mercury in it and you have to treat it as a hazardous material all the way from the time that you take that device out of the system and seal it and make sure that you keep it vertical because if you lay it down in the back of your truck, it's gonna leak the mercury out and it's gonna create problems for you. Next. Critical path method scheduling, CPM scheduling. This is something that I learned 40 years ago 
the class that I took at Colorado State University at the Solar Energy Applications Laboratory. And prior to that, I'd never really thought about it, but essentially critical path method means that you've got to build a foundation before you can start stacking wood on top of that. And once you get the roof on and you're dried in and you can bring the electricians in and the plumbers are going to start tearing stuff up regardless, but you've got to follow that critical path method. You've got to have coordination meetings with your critical subs and building management. In this particular case, we had an asbestos contractor. We had an electrical contractor that was doing our variable freak drives for our pumps. We had our boiler removal specialist, and we also have our boiler move-in specialist. We don't attempt to try to move this equipment ourselves. We use a local company called Duffy Moving and Storage, and that's what they do for a living. You tell these guys, I want it taken off of that truck, and I put an X on this floor. This is where I want it, and they will have it there. And the liability is off of you. If it falls off of their truck and breaks, they've got it covered. If it slides off their dolly and damages the wall, they've got it covered. Uh, you're not exposing your employees to the possibility of injuring themselves and getting equipment in and out. And we're not paying for it. The customer is paying for it. You just need to make sure that you take it into consideration and get it all packed into your bids so that you are covered. Uh, you've got to attain all the necessary permits, city, state, federal, et cetera, when required, and then coordinate critical components and schedule the delivery in a timely manner. And this is important. If you find yourself standing there with a boiler, but you're missing pipe out and fitting, you're not going to be able to do your job. So you've got to make sure that you've got a plan A and, as Mary proved to us today, a plan B. And essentially that plan B is to back you up in case A can't come through. And as you get the contract signed, then you want to start making those calls immediately and letting your suppliers know, I've got this project coming up. Here's my material list. Make sure that it's available at that point in time. Well, we all know there's little chains that get broken in that whole process. So have a plan B so that in case plan A fails that you don't get stuck dead in the water. You've got to coordinate your manpower and schedule accordingly. We have 15 employees in our company and they are all busy. They're all back to the wall and just running from job to job to job to job. And fortunately, we've got a general manager and all of our designers and estimators that work quite closely together with uh, Monday.com, which is a program that you can see everybody's scheduled projects, et cetera, and make sure that you've got people in place to be able to handle it. And of course, the general contractors always throw the wrench in there because the previous sub that was supposed to have gotten out of your way didn't. So consequently, they're going to have to push you, which means we have to push everybody else. But on these types of operations, you have no room for deviation whatsoever. You've got to be in. You've got to be out during a period of time that you've given them. Uh, in this particular case, a lot of this work is done for the state of Colorado, Energy Outreach Colorado. And uh, basically, they've got some pretty healthy penalties, financial incentive to get done on time. And so you've got to make sure that you get this done. Uh, watch your progressive billings. Stay ahead of your cash flow. Everybody that's in business has got a good line of credit, but uh, why stress it any more than necessary? Make sure that you stay on top of your materials. Make sure that your materials are being charged at the rate that you had anticipated in your estimation and your spreadsheet. If they're not, to get justification back from the supplier. Hey, what's going on? I thought I was going to get this for this much, and you're charging me that much. Oh, well. Oh, hang on. We gave you the wrong one. Oh, great. That, that makes a difference. Uh, request and receive all necessary inspections before the final billing. Here in Denver, we have the Denver Mechanical Department that we have to get the inspections through, as well as the state of Colorado. And the people that pay us want to see those final inspections prior to actually submitting our final bill to them. And we also have to show them our startup and commissioning report which a lot of people unfortunately don't do. You know, they flip the switch and if it goes boom and takes off and starts putting out heat, hey, you're good, I'm out of here. We wanna make sure that we've got this equipment operating as it's supposed to. We've got commissioning reports. How are you gonna know where you're going if you don't know where you've been? And if you haven't documented where you've been, then you don't know where you're gonna be going. So we do a full commissioning startup report on the system. It becomes a part of the project package. We submit it to the people that are responsible for paying us bills it makes them very happy they know that they got what they paid for and that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing next so here's the actual installation of the first two boilers and you can notice that brian and that's brian capelli on the left hand side our lead boiler mechanic one of the best mechanics i've ever met and uh, stephen martinez 
who has since moved on. I think he went back into the sheet metal business. He kept cutting himself on the pipes. Personally, I look at sheet metal, my hands start bleeding before I even touch it. But in any case, you can see that we set the system up primary, secondary. So you can see the primary that runs through there with that ball valve in the uh, betweener. And that was basically put in there so that we could aid ourselves in purging these boilers out. Uh, these are a Patterson Kelly boiler. We went above and beyond and actually made internet connections to those. I can bring those boilers up on my iPhone or my iPad at any point in time. We've had two occasions where the boilers missed a trial for ignition and locked out and sent an email to us letting us know that. Is that great or what? I knew you had a problem before you knew you had a problem and I went and resolved it. And it's it's today's boilers, they're, they're amazing. Uh, it, based on what I started doing 42 years ago, we had millivolt. That was the biggest electrical thing on that whole thing. Now every boiler has more brain power than the spaceships that went up to and landed on the moon. Uh, today is a great time to be in the hydronic heating business. But basically you can see we've got it set up primary, secondary. Uh, we set it up such that we had air separators on it. These are the other two boilers that were waiting for the boiler number two to be chopped and dropped, which is the one that's in the background. And once it was gone, then we were able to move those two boilers into place. See that big green pump up there above those boilers? That's their domestic hot water circulation return system. And I had mentioned that there are opportunities in the field that you don't even realize are there that you'll never know are there until you start asking questions. So we asked the building maintenance folks, do you spring pinhole leaks in your circulation? Oh yeah, yeah right about after every elbow. We're constantly chasing those things down. Well, there's an opportunity for you to be able to go in and sell the Clefie 116 thermal balancing valve which is going to do two things. It's gonna slow the velocity of the water down to the point where it's below erosive velocities. It unfortunately cannot reverse any damage that has already been done, but will stop any future damage going forward. And more importantly, it spreads that hot water out across that full building. You remember that photograph that we showed you of the actual building itself, how wide that thing is? I think the city block long, and I think it's piped pyramidic. So the return is actually in the middle of the building and you've got to try to balance all those branches that are going out all the way out to the exterior left and right hand side of the building. It's virtually impossible to do with any balancing system on the market. With the thermal balancing valves in there, they automatically self-balance. These pokes want to do this. It's just a matter of time before they can get some money set up so that we can go back in and retrofit those and uh, take care of those problems. But, uh, you know, if a little pump does a little good, a lot of pump will do a lot of good. And that's basically what happens in these scenarios is the maintenance people keep complaining and the residents can keep complaining. And then the plumbing contractor comes in and says, well, let me put a bigger pump in there for you. Yo. So this is the rough installation of the boilers themselves. You can see we use polypropylene venting system. You've got to make sure that you follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Also bear in mind that polypropylene has an extremely high coefficient of expansion. Any plastic tubing does. So it's gonna go from roughly 80 degrees when the boiler's in an idle condition, all the way up to potentially 160 degrees. And that coefficient of expansion is gonna do all kinds of strange things. If you don't control it, it will control you and you may not like the results. Next slide. Here's another view of the actual boilers themselves. Uh, this is looking basically down the galley of the way that Brian set them up and configured them such that you had full access to the combustion chambers plus the sides of these boilers open up for access to some of the controls that are on the inside of it next i just want to bring up too that we had a, a nice comment from steven and i can appreciate this being from the field myself is that steven wanted to applaud the mechanics for putting cardboard on top of the new boilers to protect them during construction yeah, like you, said, you know, these people are paying a lot of money for these systems. They don't need a, a nice new boiler that's got dents and, you know, flux and solder all over the top of them and everything else. So Right. We have a policy in our company that the mechanic room is going to be cleaner when we leave it than it was when we came. So there's the three water heaters that were existing. Note that the middle water heater doesn't have any control lights. That's because it was dead. It was literally dead in the water. And they hadn't closed the isolation valve. That's the first thing we did when we realized it was dead was to close the isolation valve. And the engineer said, hey, all of a sudden we got hot water everywhere in the building. Yeah, interesting how that works. Next slide. And another view, this is the center galleyway. 
you can see the access to the actual individual controls on each one of the boilers themselves. Next. This is where we get into the heart of the system. We had two five horsepower pumps. Uh, essentially what we did is installed variable frequency drives. Next slide. We did have one We're question. Controlling these. Oh, we had one sure. question from Steven. He asked about what the static pressure was at the boilers. And I think he also asked, uh, based on the height of the building, did you have any pressure issues at the bottom? We had a lot of pressure at the bottom, I can tell you that much. Uh, basically, it's a half pound per vertical foot of elevation, plus we like to keep additional five pounds of residual pressure at the top. So we had 13 stories, that would be 130 feet, uh, 65 PSI plus five. So yeah, we were running about 70 pounds of pressure on the bottom of these systems. Uh, this, this is a close up, apologize for the poor photograph. This is a pressure differential control. What we did is we took the performance curves of the two five horsepower pumps that were existing and we looked at the knee of the curve and figured out what the pressure differential was on average. And we set it up so that we were basically running a 20 PSI differential, which would be about a 40 foot feet of head differential. And basically the pumps using the variable freak drives from Danfoss essentially controlled these pumps based on that demand. And it gets above 65 degrees Fahrenheit. The whole heating system is completely disabled. The boilers do only domestic hot water at that point, and the pumps are shut completely off. And when they start back up again, once they get down to about 50 degrees, then basically the pumps turn on, they go to full speed, they check the pressure differential, and then they start modulating back based on demand. And with the non electric TRVs, essentially you've got modulating boilers, modulating flow and modulating pumps, which is the ideal of all conditions. Next slide. So as you're installing or you're estimating and figuring where you're gonna be putting your venting system into the system, personally, I would really rather take my venting system all the way through the roof. People are used to seeing steam plumes coming off of a roof, but it's not always possible. In this particular case, with 130 foot of developed length, it was exceeding the manufacturer's recommended length. Uh, so we essentially had to go to a horizontal type of venting system. Now those black railings that you see there are not actually porches. That's actually a turnaround space for the emergency stairwell exit that is attached to the building itself. Next photo, please. So there you can see the vent terminations for the boilers. We had four vent terminations for our space slash domestic hot water heating system. And then the third, three terminations that are there over there to the right were the domestic hot water heating system. And we essentially ended up getting rid of those and setting our reverse indirects and tying them in. And we had to tie them in in such a manner that we could maintain domestic hot water. Hence the reason for that letter to explain to people to expect interruptions and that we try to schedule them whenever possible, but that there was a possibility that we may have to do an emergency valve change out without notification to them. So as you set these things up, you've got to make sure that you're going to have vent terminations that are in compliance with the manufacturer's clearance to operable doors, windows, walkways, etc. And uh, the amount of steam that these things put out is amazing. I'm going to uh, do a little bit of an experiment on this thing with a venturi fitting. It's what they call a velocity cone. But if I put two velocity cones on there, then basically I end up with a venturi and I will drill some holes in the final increaser, which would normally be a decreaser if it were on the other side, and see if I can dilute that stream of plume coming off of the boilers to lessen the visual effects. Uh, don't get many complaints from the residents about this steam plume. They're kind of used to it now, but initially they see a little bit of steam waft past their window, they freak out. <laughs> Whoa, something's on fire. That's uh, just the boilers. Next slide. Well, yeah, too, Mark, I just wanted to mention, too, you know, the, the condensate, you know, you, you talk about where to put that termination, and that condensate is acidic, too, right? I mean, it, it can really do it some is. damage if, if it's in the wrong spot. I mean, I've seen houses, just residential houses, where the, you know, the furnace exhaust is pointed right out the driveway, and, and then all of a sudden, they're chewing through the clear coat on their cars, you know, and yeah. and uh, it's pretty interesting in that. Um, but uh, we did have one question, you know, and I, I think this is a good one. What, uh, they asked, how did you handle the stack with the new boilers? Obviously, there was that original uh, <clears throat> vent stack going up through the building. Did you end up just capping it off then or? Yes, we did. Actually, we put sheet metal under the bottom of it to basically block it off completely. 
And during the course of construction, uh, as Brian and those guys were inside working on that mechanical room, it was hotter than Hades down there with that old fire breathing dragon still sitting there at 180 degrees. The mechanical room was about 90 degrees, if not hotter. And so he actually loosened some of the sheet metal and pulled it down and the room cooled off immediately. That's how much stack action there was. We measured it at a quarter of an inch. There was a quarter of an inch static wow. pressure water column on that stack. So when he loosened the sheet metal up just a little bit, it was like, strap yourself down so you don't get sucked <laughs> up into that thing or you'll end up on the roof. So yeah. it was pretty good to cool it down. Well, I know, I know too here in the state of Wisconsin, we actually had a program to where if you were capping off um, uh, like any type of natural draft chimney like that, there was some rebate incentives for that. Did you have that in your market there in Colorado or no? There are some. Uh, a lot of the money that the EOC distributes is basically Department of Energy money for retrofit of uh, low-income housing projects. And XL Energy, who is our supplier, and I think they're your supplier up there too, uh, here in Colorado, they provide not only the electricity, but also the fuel. However, this particular property had purchased the fuel through a subsequent downstream supplier, and it wasn't getting it through XL Energy. So XL Energy is kind of reluctant to perform on the thermal side, but they did provide some rebates for the application of the variable frequency drives on the heating system itself. So yes, there are some incentives, but uh, you know, I, I really don't usually worry about incentives. The biggest incentive these people have is to set the system up so that it works and that their phone quits ringing and the residents have plenty of hot water and their fuel bills are less than what they had before because you know, one thing that happened on this particular property was that originally they had two boiler inspections. Well, actually they had a total of five because they had the three water heaters that were subject to state inspection, their ASME and they require a state annual inspection and then the two boilers. Well, we came back in with four boilers, so we actually reduced their budget for boiler inspections. And it's something important to remember if you go in and they've only got one boiler and you're gonna be putting in four, make sure to tell them to boost their budget for their annual boiler inspections because you went from one to four. And depending on the state, in Colorado, if we have one pair of isolation valves that isolates all four boilers, then that's one boiler system. It only requires one permit. But we don't like to do that. We like to give each boiler its own individual isolation so that we can work on it without having to shut down the whole system. And then in that case, you end up with four inspections for the boilers, four permits. Definitely something to think about there too. There was another good question here from uh, Jarrett. He mentions that uh, in New York State, there's lots of incentives for heat pumps and we're seeing more and more talk about air to water heat pumps and everything like that. Uh, he just asked if you have any opinions on using air to water heat pumps as a replacement for these commercial boilers or in combination with a gas boiler, maybe to kind of do a, um, you know, take care of the, the lower demands and then, you know, sure. boost it up with the gas. Right. The, the biggest problem with air and ground source heat pumps at present is that their maximum hot water temperature availability is around 115 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that point, your coefficients of performance is just almost right at one to one, which means you'd be better off with the strip resistance heater in there. The other problem is, is that most hot water baseboard systems, and this system is on an outdoor reset, start at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can't even get to your minimum operating temperature with the refrigerant style of system, whether it's ground source, air source, whatever it happens to be. Uh, now, I know there are some manufacturers out there that have a hot gas bypass that have the ability to be able to generate water temperatures up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So it is becoming more and more feasible. But usually what you run into is a lack of electrical power in the mechanic room to be able to handle the demand that's imparted by those heat pumps. Plus, there's a problem of tonnage. Uh, each ton is 12,000 BTUs. If I'm looking at 4 million BTUs worth of capacity, that's a whole lot of tons of refrigerant that I'm going to have to get into that mechanical room. Yep, for sure. Yeah. And then I think that's just a, a great thing to mention, you know, the, the fact that there's an application for every product and not every application is going to use that particular product and, you know, using what's best for your customer. That's what makes you the professional, you know, and, and helping them figure out what's going to work best in their application. So, I mean, if, if we had an unlimited bucket of money and we could go in and put in radiant ceilings, or radiant floors, large surface radiant emitters of whatever style, then yes, the 120 degrees would be perfectly compatible to it. But with this all being hot water baseboard and having been done with the Long Island heat loss method, then basically we're still confined to having to use hot water 
which my definition of hot water is anything between 140 and 180 degrees Fahrenheit. For sure, for sure. Well, I think we're going to basically finish up there with the questions and everything. I know we're going over just a little bit over on time here, but we want to appreciate uh, or respect everybody's time here uh, in the webinar today. The great attendance with this webinar. And Mark, I can't uh, I can't thank you enough for your expertise, um, not only for me and, and Kalefi, but for everybody that got to listen here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I can speak for them as well. Well, thank you. I very much appreciate uh, my employer, Tom Olds and Jim French for allowing me to uh, participate in this stuff and share my knowledge with the industry, which raises everybody. For sure. Yeah. A, a, a rising tide raises all, you know, rises, raises all ships, so to speak, for sure. You know, I mean, the more we it's, can share, the more we can get it, it out there and, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's a great thing, but, uh, you know, if, if there are any questions, you know, I, I want to make sure that everybody on the, on the line here today knows that they can give us a call at Kalefi. Uh, we've got a great team, even though we're not in the office right now, we're all working from home. I'm currently in my anti coronavirus bunker, just like, uh, just like Mark. Um, and, uh, same thing with, uh, Greg and Dan and Kevin there as well. And so again, we're all here to help you out and make sure you have all your questions answered, uh, when it comes to application of products. And then, uh, from there, um, make sure to follow us on all those social medias. You know, I mentioned before that uh, we're working with Mechanical Hub uh, over the last few weeks and upcoming weeks uh, to do some of the uh, uh, shop talk with hot rods and, and everything else. And so uh, if you have any comments on, on any future webinars we always want to hear those too because it's you know we we always are looking for new topics and, and things like that and uh in the end again just thank you very much for your time and, and again thank you for your expertise mark and and i hope everybody has a great day you're welcome and oh by the way congratulations grandpa roar <laughs> yep and and uh yep good old hot rod has is uh is a very recent grandpa how are you feeling feeling bob yeah i'm about the same <laughs> no change here yeah well very cool i'll well, enjoy that little one bob and uh and again everybody else have a great day and and uh and stay safe stay Thanks, safe keep your hands clean keep your head up and your spirits higher <laughs> perfect thanks mark you bet